two, one, two, five, four, three, two, one, two. Check. One, two, three, four. Check. One, two, three. audience yet, in a way. Looks like you're near all in your liturgy. Somebody say something to make me laugh, please. Orson Welles once said that if you want a happy ending, you need to know when to end your story. And so I've called you all here today to announce the end of my story as the ninth premier of Newfoundland and Labrador. You know, I, I laugh when critics and some reporters say that I'm nothing more than a fighter. Someone always looking for a racket, never happy, unless I'm taking someone on. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you today that those people are right. the people of Newfoundland had expressed their desire to enter into confederation. The date of union on which we have set our sights is March 31st, 1949. six years ago said that Atlantic Canadians had a culture of defeat. Well, let me tell you, Steve, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have no culture of defeat. Let me tell you that. We are fighting Newfoundlanders. We rant and roar like true Newfoundlanders. And we will not give up on this cause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I was born in, in 1949. I was born after Confederation. Uh, you know, Confederation was, of course, in April. And I was born on August 4th, so that would have been five months after Confederation.
Well, Newfoundland's a very old place. We were our own country from the 1400s right up till 1949. It was always very cosmopolitan. You always had boats coming in from all over the world, so you never got that small city feeling. It was always very much connected to the, to the whole world. Of course, we were our own country up till 1933 when the British came in and unceremoniously stripped us of our democracy. <laughs> yeah. Britain wanted Newfoundland for the air race. They wanted to establish air supremacy, the North Atlantic route, and they needed Newfoundland to do it. And that's why they decided to come in and take over. So they knew Newfoundland was central to aviation. And if they wanted to control the air routes of North America and the North Atlantic, they would have to control Newfoundland. And of course, this is what Roosevelt wanted anyway. Roosevelt and Churchill had made their deal that Newfoundland would not be allowed to be independent after the war. They couldn't risk it, have to go with either the States or Britain or Canada. So then Britain has to work it out in some kind of democratic process. So they set up a national convention of elected Newfoundlanders to decide what kind of government you want, but it has no power. Mr. Chairman, I move the following resolution. Be it resolved that the National Convention desires to recommend to His Majesty's government in the United Kingdom that the following form of government be placed before the people of Newfoundland. Namely, confederation with Canada upon the basis submitted to the National Convention Britain, in spite of many factions that wanted to hang on to Newfoundland, decided they had to get rid of it. So then the British conduct this. They give Joey as much time as possible to sell Confederation to the people. It was right down the middle, and the British nudged it over. But the official version is that Confederation won by a narrow mar margin, and that was, you know, what the, no recount, no poll count. Very shabbily done very shabbily done. And we lost our democracy and our right to negotiate terms. Everything was gone. We never had, we never negotiated terms with Canada. Britain did that. It was all, it was all uh, a fraud, basically. Were we hoodwinked? I don't think so. I don't think we were, I think we were certainly encouraged to go a certain way. But no, I don't think it was a rigged vote. I think Newfoundlanders voted the way they voted. It turned out the way uh, it turned out. Uh, but, you know, I, I got a feeling the whole issue of conspiracy will, uh, will exist forever. Uh, you know, it'll always be interesting, but it will also always be uh, irrelevant. I do think that, uh, you know, there's lots of benefits of us joining Canada, but I got to tell you, I think Canada got the best of the deal when they got us. After Newfoundland very narrowly gave up its independence and joined with Canada, came the first what was called baby bonus checks, came the first pension checks, came the first security checks from the federal government in Ottawa. People in this province believe they came directly from Joe Smallwood. He signed them himself is what they thought. So he went from being marginally popular to being undefeatable for 20 some odd years. Go further, if I could get the devil himself, if I could get Uncle Lucifer, if I could get the devil to come and start and employ a thousand men at good wages, come on in, come on in. We came in the Confederation and we came in with money in the bank. We came in with, you know, probably one of the best fisheries in the entire world. Uh, you know, we brought in the, uh, the hydro power, the Churchill, uh, was there, people were aware of it. So, you know, we came with some pretty lucrative assets uh, into Confederation. So it was obviously in Canada's best interest to have control of these assets. $600 million on that shovel. Now we're going to put one more on it. It won't be silver, it'll be gold. And it'll stand for $800 million. And that will be the Churchill project. And so now we turn this remarkable, this amazing sod, this very unusual sod. The development that was done in the late 60s, which is the Upper Churchill, uh, unfortunately was very, very inequitable. It was very unbalanced. It was probably the biggest giveaway of all time that we've ever had in the province and ever will. And uh, we did a bad deal. 
if we had gotten our fair share of that deal back in the late 60s and early 70s, we would have been a Hav province a long, long time ago, and we never would have looked back. I'm proud to say that I never once said anything negative about Premier Smallwood or what he did during the period of time when he was in office, because my feeling on that personally was, you know, it's very difficult to judge people. Uh, you know, if you're not there in their shoes, and if they're not across from you and able to argue their case. Grave four. It's my first, I guess, encounter with the Christian brothers as teachers and tough disciplinarians, but wonderful teachers. I was in this classroom with people like Greg Malone and Andy Jones. Uh, no, 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 no! Mr. Lawrence, huh? I'm a Newfoundlander, no? I'm a Newfoundlander. Uh, break it up, pieces. I'm a Newfoundlander. I'm a Newfoundlander. Look, look. I can remember Brother Clancy uh, uh, attempting to slap everyone's face in the class. Like he ran down the corridor, sort of across. Uh, eventually, some people realized what was happening, so they got out of the way, but he, he tried to get everyone's face. I remember that really well. You went there in grade one, and you were looking at guys in grade 12, or men, like, you know what I mean? And, and the bands playing, and the drama clubs, and the hockey team, and the basketball team. There was a lot going on. And it was all run by the Irish Christian Brothers with an iron fist. We were close to the old, old brutal days, but it was not quite as brutal. It was a little more civilized. Every part of his body which had offended the Lord burst into flames <laughs> and burned for eternity. Good afternoon, boys and girls. I think there was a lot of... Um, uh, all of our class experienced a lot of <laughs> unresolved rage, unresolved feelings from, from those from that period. I, I know I do, and I know Andy Jones does, and I presume Danny does. You know he's got a lot of rage in him from somewhere. <laughs> a lot of fight, let's say. My father went here, and that's why, you know, he put me here in, in grade four. There was only one year when I was at St. Bonds when, you know, I didn't receive the strap on several occasions, but that's the way it was in those days. Of course, in those days, everyone was, you know, uh, graded. Uh, so you knew where you stood, like you were first, second, third, fourth, or 25th, or 38th, or whatever. And uh, Danny was, I think, pretty well always number one at St. Bonds. used to take him down. He was probably about, about three or four. The father used to take him down to skating, take him by the hand. I used to go to the hockey games. And when he'd get into a fight with a fella, I'd be, I'd be up there screeching. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to him, Daddy. <laughs> get. When Danny was young, you could get living help to come, stay from the outports. The girls would come in. So this girl, Marion Lee was her name, she came in from St. Mary's. And she just adored Danny. She reared him for me. So she was doing everything for him. And uh, I said, well, I may as well get moving. The politics started, and that was it. That was a godsend for me. I loved it, loved it. Beats these had no money to pay anybody. We we got by on pennies, but we, we had a, a barrel of fun. Mom actually campaigned, went door to door, and was a campaign manager for many significant ministers, federal and provincial, in many elections. She was a take charge kind of woman, and you know, and still is to this day. Her maiden name was Galway. Her and her sisters were fairly well known in the city as dancing instructors. I, you know, I was around her quite a bit and spent a fair bit of time with her and her sisters and then also really cut my eye teeth in politics because that was a big part of our house. My father was more of a quieter man, but yet 
As a lawyer, he was a very strong advocate. He was extremely good in the courtroom. Uh, you know, as many times I can remember, instead of taking a cash payment for his services, there would be a box of partridge or a box of rabbits would show up at the house or, or at the office. And I remember going out and, you know, cleaning the blood off the carpet because it was left and just deposited there. And, but I was fortunate because I got a chance to actually sit in the courtroom and, and watch, you know, my father uh, cross-examine uh, the Mounties. You know, I'd see him, I'd see how he conducted himself, I'd see how he handled the cases. So I, you know, at a very early age, I learned the strategy of doing it. But he was very competitive, and he was a, he was a competitive tennis player. He was in the Hall of Fame, and all, you know, an all for that athlete in tennis. So I think I picked up that competitive side from my father. There's about seven and a half years uh, between myself and my brother Ed. Ed then came Nancy, and then came Tommy, so then they, they had the four children, and that was it. I was conceived before Confederation, so perhaps if they knew we weren't going to, uh, we were going to join Canada, they probably wouldn't have had me in the first place, and I may not be here today. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a huge night for me, I must say. You know, having come out of politics, this is the the first new private sector venture that I've gotten back in since I've gotten out of politics. And I love hockey and to have the opportunity to be operating your own NHL franchise. I mean, I'm actually, the Winnipeg Jets actually own the franchise, but I'm actually operating it on a lease over the course of the next four years. So, you know, that's a special privilege and an honor and a lot of fun. Well, you got the gift of gab there tonight. Hey, the game will be over, for God's sake, by the time we get in. How are you doing? Oh, Where's 22? Frank, that's where I am this year. 22 is over here. Man. Okay. Look at my notes now for going to be up reception. Newfoundland, Canada's happy province. Yeah, yeah, that must have been where they got the idea to. Oh, but you know, it's not just an idea, it's a reality. Yes, girl, we're a very happy people. Maybe we don't have some of the advantages that some of your richer provinces got. Alberta, Ontario, and the like. But our happiness boy is of the more intangible sort. You can't actually touch it, like the food and the clothing. And... Early on, for some reason or other, we had the knowledge that it was important to be able to make fun of ourselves, to put ourselves equally with everybody else. In other words, it was equal opportunity mockery. I think Mary Walsh called it that, right? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's like, uh, and you say, well, you can't make fun of Native people. You say, well, what? Is there something wrong with them? You know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah, of course you can make fun of everybody. We needed to have a sense of ourselves if we were going to be strong in going up against Canada as a tiny, tiny, tiny place in this big, big country. And Quebec had that sense. I do remember when in the early Codco days that my mother would always uh, sort of, she had her, her round of reviewers that she would phone and find out what the reaction was to the early Codco shows. And Mrs. Williams was, was one of them. Uh, she was one of the, the Galway sisters. In fact, all the Galway sisters, I think, had, you know, she, they filtered their comments through her, and so Mom would report, this is what the Galway sister thought about the show, right? My, as my mother used to say, it's like, I don't mind a bit of dirt, but for God's sake, don't make fun of the Pope. <laughs> as we went through the 70s and we started to see what was happening and, you know, what we were really, you know, getting from Canada and what Canada was taking from us, I think it became quite apparent that we weren't getting a really fair shake. You know, instead of being sort of, you know, moderate Tories, we became very, very strong conservatives uh, and were, you know, I guess dedicated at that point in time to uh, seeing that the Smallwood government was eventually replaced. for so long, the BCs. And when Frank got elected, we all went up to the Premier's office. <laughs> I said, I'm dancing on the top of that desk. <laughs> and, all right, all the problems, okay, go on, they put me up and I
us some company in there. <laughs> Hockey's been a big part of my life. Big part of it. Lombardi said, you know, winning isn't everything, but wanting to win is. And there's such a lot of truth in it. You know, you need to want to win. You need to want to achieve. You fall just short, that's fine. But as long as there's a good, hard effort, and of course, you know, that's, that's, those are the kind of lessons that, that uh, hockey taught me. It also taught you how to lose. Pretty bad when a hard part of the game is lacing up your skates. There we go. And even through business and through the legal side, you know, a lot of people, that whole hockey fraternity is a big group of people and very, very tightly knit. Where's Eddie? Where's, where's Eddie? You get that sprayer? <laughs> yeah. I knew Danny when he had relatively modest means. You know, he didn't have a silver spoon in his mouth. He was a young man of 25 or 26 when we met. He called me and asked me would I uh, come to a tryout in the fall for a junior team he was putting together. Come on, Frank, let's go. Hey, he's here. Thankfully, I made the team, and uh, that's where I met Danny. I got to know him pretty well. <laughs> nice work, man. Nice fucking work, man. The Rhodes Scholarship was actually introduced to me by my father. You know, I had no intention of applying for the Rhodes Scholarship. He basically did all the work, put it all together, prepared the application, and said, sign it, here it is. Now, at the time, you know, I was 19. It was a horrific experience for me, because I was used to home, liked home, and then went, and all of a sudden, I was on my own in this place that I really had no interest in going to in the first place. Once I got adjusted, I got some good friends in England, and I got sort of used to the the English culture a bit, and I, you know, I enjoyed that part of it. And of course, those were great days in England, though. Those were the, uh, what, the 69, 70, 71 days of the Beatles, Carnaby Street, you know, all the great music, mini skirts, you know, fashion, everything, everything was going on in England. I used to get uh, barrister's gowns made. There was a robe maker on uh, Broad Street in Oxford who made gowns, and I went down to see him because I knew from my father that in Newfoundland, there might have been a dozen lawyers who had gowns, and all the rest of them used to borrow gowns from all the other from the other lawyers. What I would do is I'd get a half dozen robes made in in England, and I could sell them for 100 or 150 bucks. And so that was the way I managed to pay for my airfare back and forth by being, bringing gowns. So I probably pretty well robed the entire legal profession while I was uh, while I was at Oxford. I came back after that year and I married Maureen and then immediately left within a week and headed off to Halifax and went to Dalhousie to do a Canadian law degree. And of course had the old station wagon with everything in the world that we owned in that station wagon. Shortly after that, I just headed on back home, and then it was all about, you know, getting a house or an apartment. It was an apartment at that time, and then moved into practice with my father and his partner. Then when I got back, I got back and finished in 72, and of course, our first daughter, Gillian, was born in 73. My parents bred old English sheepdogs. I always grew up with dogs around the house. We always had big dogs. Mom used to say, uh, you know, Danny, we need a new dishwasher. And he'd say, okay, well, let's breed Casey, and that was their their female dog, and um, they'd breed her, and sure enough, they'd get their dishwasher, and then they did the same thing for a fridge, and, and I think a washer and dryer. We didn't have a lot of things, but you know, we had clothes, we had food, we had, you know, all the things that, you know, love, lots of love. And then it was in 74, uh, that following year, that I was contacted. He said, look, you know, we're going to apply for a cable license in St. John's, or we'd like to, and we'd like to get someone to get a group together, but we're behind the eight ball, and we need to move really fast. So my first response was, what's a cable license? I had no idea what cable television was, and, you know, I knew it was a challenge, but I also knew that it was a rewarding business proposition if you could make it work. I think if there was 10% of the company that was available to me as a founder, so in order to get that 10%, I had to borrow $5,000. I just bought a house and had sort of, you know, gone out and bored to the hilt, you know, to get that house. The house was $30,000. So I just went to my father and said, you want a piece of the action here? We're going to try this. If you want to come in for $2,500, we'll split the shares down the middle 
And I remember on, uh, on Christmas Eve in 1975, I'll never forget it, I'd gone down to the store, I'd gone to actually Canadian Tire, which was my favorite store, and probably still is in those days, where I'd go down and pick up whatever we need, and it was around Christmas time, so obviously it was extension cords and paper and everything else I was getting. And I remember coming back to the house, and Maureen said, uh, you got the license, and I thought it was my car license. I said, oh, great, this good. No, 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 she said, you got the, you got the cable license. And I was just in shock. where I realized your father and son can't work together forever, and I decided I'm going to have to leave him and his firm. Probably one of the toughest decisions that I've made my entire life, to be quite frank. I wanted to be able to, you know, grow the practice. I also wanted to be involved, you know, in some, you know, other business dealings, and of course, obviously expand my interests in the cable company. And the firm was Williams and Williams, and I was leaving. The problem is, you know, when you're when you're working for family or working with your father, it's you're you're always the son, you're not the partner. You know, I'm I'm being stifled a little bit. Not that it was from any will will because it wasn't. He was a wonderful man and a and a, you know a great law partner from that perspective. But I was still his son, and you know I had bigger things to do. Uh, but by the same token, you know I I still know that I was his eldest. I was in practice with him. Uh, I knew that any attempt by me to, you know, to move out was going to be, you know, difficult. We occupied a uh, former church over on Logie Bay Road, and I remember as I walked out the door that day, he uh, he was at the top of the stairs, and I remember looking back at him, and tears were coming down my cheeks. He wasn't he wasn't he wasn't going to cry because he was too proud a man for that, and I respected him for that. But I knew it had to be tearing his heart out because it was tearing mine out when I uh, when I when I did it. I've always thought I've had kind of David and Goliath syndrome, you know, it's just because I've, I've always been a fighter, even though I don't consider myself tough in a physical sense of the way, because I'm not a big man, but, but even when I played hockey and I played, you know, junior hockey and then I was, you know, I was always in trouble. Never could back down from a fight, never could back down from the bully, never could back down from somebody who was trying to push somebody else around, whether it happened to be me or somebody else. And maybe it came from being that little guy who got the smack in the face long time ago, nobody came to help him out and kind of thought, okay, that's enough of that. That's not going to happen again. It was probably around Christmas time in my third year of, uh, of law school and the phone rang in my apartment and it was Danny Williams on the phone. And I hadn't spoken with him in a while. And he said, look, I've left my dad's firm. Um, I'm, I've started another firm. I'd like for you to consider joining us. So uh, I started in. Walked through the door, it wasn't five minutes later, the phone rang and he, he said, here you go, he's your first client. So <laughs> we've been together ever since. Well, Danny's been acting for the little guy and the little girl from day one. His practice was never big corporate clients. I do know that in those days, in a lot of cases, there would be no fee charged if there was no ability to pay it. My God, you know, he was, uh, he was Perry Mason, he was Matlock. Uh, he was brilliant as a, as, a, as a jurist, as a lawyer. I think after about a decade of practicing law, you know, I felt I was, I was ready to, uh, to start to do some heavier criminal work. You know, lawyers have said, had said to me, you know, you haven't practiced law until you've done a jury trial. And it's very true. That experience before a jury, for me, was the, was the ultimate in a, in a legal experience because not only are you dealing with a judge on matters of law, you're dealing with 12 of your peers, men and women, who are standing back and making an independent assessment of the facts coupled with the interpretation of the law. And it's a fascinating experience because, you know, as I'm speaking to you, I'm, you speak to a jury. Danny's mantra was work harder, work harder, work harder, you know, hard work, beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And, you know, outwork them, outwork them. And, you know, here's two guys against a police force.
There's good and bad everything. There's good doctors and bad doctors, and good lawyers and bad lawyers, and good politicians and bad politicians, and there's good priests and there's bad priests, and there's good brothers and there's bad brothers. Well, originally, the Mount Cashel case came to the office in the early 90s. At that time, uh, Jack Harris was lead on the file. This abuse on these young males at the time uh, was horrific. They were prisoners, and uh, they were being abused by the people who were their masters. So what I did was took, sat down through the profiles and probably and took what I felt was probably the most, most serious case from a perspective of taking it to court. And this was a chap by the name of Jerry Brinston. And Basically, I, I might have some of the facts wrong, but if I recollect that three or four, he and his sister were orphaned. I think his mother, father died, then his mother died. Then he went to the orphanage. He was abused at the orphanage. She was abused by several of the brothers there. Uh, then on the weekends, uh, he was being abused by some of the priests who were, uh, who were visiting the orphanage. He was then sent off sometimes to Halifax for weekends. Uh, where he was a victim of abuse there with some of the clergy in Halifax. Uh, he ultimately uh, went on the streets at about 15 uh, as a male prostitute and developed HIV. And so it was a sad, sad, sad story. I remember one individual who'll go unnamed who had a call from his lawyer who said, you know, he's been subpoenaed for Monday. Uh, he's home, he's bedridden, he won't come, he can't come to court. Well, I said, I'll bring him in on a bloody stretcher because he's coming to court. And so you better find a way or you better have some good medical evidence why he can't show up. I remember that weekend, the Santa Claus parade was on, so it was, would have been around November, December. I had been negotiating with the provincial government uh, at the time and had basically said to Premier's officials who were the Department of Justice, uh, look, you know, this needs to be settled. This is a uh, black mark on the history of the province. It's a black mark for everybody here. It needs to be brought to closure. Let's get it settled. And, you know, full points to the government of that day, they settled on the eve of the trial. That was a significant piece of closure for all of them and something that we were, we were very proud to do, but it was very, very difficult piece of work. I'm doing fine, boy. You got your hair all done. Your hair's all done nice. Come on, Blighty. I'm saying, they're a great bunch. No, great, wonderful, uh, wonderful, 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 wonderful. wonderful. I didn't encourage him. I never really did encourage him to go into politics. Never did. Because I know, you know, I saw too much heartbreak through the years over, you know. And uh, no, but he had his mindset. That was it. He was gone. So I went to the family. And the majority of the family were, were on sides. The main one, of course, at that point was Maureen. And if Maureen said, yeah, go for it, fine. So Maureen had said yes. I remember always saying to him, you know, Dad, if it's, it's in your blood, it was in your mother's blood, it's in your blood. And if it's something that you want to do, I think that you should do it. Because if you don't, you're never, ever going to forgive yourself for it. And then I went off for kind of just a soul-searching mission, just to say, like, you know, do I really want to do this? I'm 50, practiced law for 30 years. You know, I've made my dollar. I managed to get the cable company sold for uh, between 230 and $250 million. And I can just sail off into the sunset and live happily ever after. And then I kind of went through a realization that, look, you know, if I don't do this, you know, I could look back in 10 years' time, which is really now, and say, you know, maybe I could have made a difference. I saw that we were so resource rich. Somebody was always coming in and just cherry picking us and just taking it away. So I said, no, I'm going in with an attitude of no more giveaways. And that was the mantra. But it was exactly how I felt and I feel that way to this day. To the best of my knowledge and ability. Ex execute the office of the leader of the Newfoundland and Labrador Progressive Conservative Party. Execute the office of the leader of the Newfoundland and Labrador Progressive Conservative Party. And that I will uphold the Constitution. And that I will uphold the Constitution. And bylaws that govern the conduct of our party. 
and bylaws that govern the conduct of our party. She's yours, buddy. Thank you. Right on. <laughs> right on. He's going right here. He's in. Good morning. Good job. Good job. And let me tell you one more time, Roger Grimes. Let's lace up the skates, buddy, and let's have a general election. Because you're going down. Danced again on top of it, but Danny got elected. And how old were you then? Oh, too old. I should have had more sense. <laughs> You know, walking into the Premier's office as Premier was, was a really different experience. All of a sudden, you know, you're eight floors up, you look out over the city of St. John's, you think, holy shit, I now have taken over this job. It's a big responsibility, and even more importantly, uh, there's over a half million people who are totally relying on my judgment. We all had different roles. Brian was chief of staff, I was communications. You know, we had titles. Steve was deputy chief of staff. He always involved us in all facets of running the office. From my point of view, the hardest part of this job was briefing him. Have you ever briefed a brilliant man? <laughs> it's tough. It's tough to do. The one question he asks you after giving that full detailed briefing is the one answer you don't have. The province had gone through some difficult times. And you know, in the early 90s, you know, you obviously had the COD moratorium. And, I think if I remember correctly, some 50 out of 1,000 Newfoundlanders basically were out of jobs during that process. Oh, you and your people took it! No, I'm trying to do my job. Yes, you're doing shit out of it. Six generations down the line passed down, and he's done nothing but S-H-I-T to his... And with that, fishermen stormed the doors of John Crosby's news conference. So this had a huge impact on a population of a half million people. Uh, there was significant out-migration. Uh, you know, the economy was in decline. There was significant disparity in our economics. We were struggling. Immediately when I got in there, within months, I had to make some really tough decisions. You just started in the office, so you're full of enthusiasm and optimism and great ideas. And before you can start to implement anything, all of a sudden you're just faced with this report. So we had to announce a wage sector freeze, you know, within months of my election. Now, I have never said this in public before, but I'm saying it now, that Danny Williams lied. He lied to the labor movement on several occasions. You know, I remember in the office during that whole period, looking out down onto the parking lot in front of the uh, Confederation building and seeing at times 10,000 people standing up, looking up, shake some of them, a lot of them shaking their fists. And I remember being in that office. In the background, I had a, a, a music playing, which was Tom Petty, which was Don't Back Down. I kept playing it constantly, constantly, constantly. I liked the sound of it, I liked the message, and it just kept me motivated that I had to stay the course on this. Not because I wanted to be a hard ass, but because I had to make some tough decisions in order to get this province to start to swing around. It's fair to say the first year and a half to two years that Danny was in power, they were not good years for Danny Williams. Everybody kind of got a shock. Um, and didn't realize, well, this is not how I envisioned being in government. And we would had to, you know, find ways to get into the Confederation building to go to work every day because they had the place uh, barricaded, essentially. It uh, wasn't fun. No. It wasn't fun at all. And remember, everything was new. You know, we hadn't been in government at that point, so it was all yeah. learnings. You guys were young, right? I mean, you're young now. This was how many years ago? Ten, Ten years, years ago. Ten years ago. So, like, you were young to be dealing with such heavy-duty yep. stuff. 
I was under 30. <laughs> that was unnecessary and uncalled for. <laughs> you know, it's one thing for us as staff to have those feelings like, geez, you know, this is, we're into a pretty different time than what you envision when you first take office and come up with a large majority government. Boom, we're going to take this province by storm and hang on a second. I got my next door neighbor out on a strike mm -hmm. because of what I'm doing here. I was never governed, internally governed by the fact that I just got to get elected again. I just got to get elected the next time around. So that, that was kind of the way I approached things. Sometimes you can't compromise because if you're going to try and get to the ultimate goal, you have to stay a tough course to get there and then hopefully it's better for everybody at the end of the day. And then you had to roll into dealing with the problem at hand, which was those sustained deficits. And that was, I mean, that was brutal. Some of the things that were looked at, you know, it was literally everything from, from funding for false teeth for, for low-income people mm -hmm. to uh, health care to hospital closures. You know, the full gamut was on the table. We need to see where the major sources of revenue are. And our major sources of revenue are uh, the federal government, which would be, you know, transfer payments, which is one, but I was trying to move us away from that. Again, it comes back to the fact that when we joined Confederation, you know, our bountiful resources, most of them, are offshore. History, I think, will record that Danny struck in politics at the same time somebody yelled, oil. And the interesting thing I think that you know, people didn't really get and people didn't understand even in Canada with regard to our offshore resources, our fishery, our oil and gas, is that every other province in the country has full control of their resources and full benefit from their resources, like Alberta for example. But because ours is offshore and it's underwater, uh, the federal government has control of those resources, which is really, you know, inequitable and unfair. So that's why over the years we've had such issues with our fishery because the people who actually control the fishery are, are the federal government. Well, in the beginning, I didn't know Paul Martin very well. I knew about him. Uh, you know, I had read about him. I knew his reputation. Uh, you know, I admired him for what he'd accomplished, you know, on the, for the country as a finance minister in the Gretchen government, uh, you know, it appeared very clear to me that Paul Martin was a major factor in turning the economy around. I felt he knew what he was doing, and I liked the man. And then during the election campaign, Paul Martin then, as leader of the Liberal Party, came to town, indicated that, uh, you know, he was prepared to uh, grant Newfoundland and Labrador their fair share as principal beneficiary. Prime Minister Martin made a, a commitment that um, Newfoundland and Labrador would get the full benefit of its offshore oil royalties. He had made this commitment to us and he made it publicly to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Once he got in office and once he got in power, you know, obviously the, the responsibility of running a country like Canada is huge. And on a small scale, I know what I've got to try and do in Newfoundland and Labrador. So, you know, multiply that by 100 and that's what he's got to do. So then over the course of the next couple of months, there was some discussion back and forth. And then finally there was a, uh, an overture from the federal government that there was going to be a meeting held in Winnipeg. If you're called by the Prime Minister's office out to the other end of the country, you feel pretty confident that there's something um, good's going to happen. We thought we were going to go and seal the, the deal on uh, the Atlantic Accord and equalization. Yeah. And I uh, felt very confident going, you know, this is it, bring it home, give everyone a great Christmas gift. And, and then we got there and started meeting with uh, some senior federal government folks and it was clear after about eight seconds that uh, <laughs> this wasn't going to happen. I knew we were doomed when we got frozen inside the plane when we landed. So, yes. And they had to I get feel uh, industrial size, <laughs> they had to get industrial size hair blowers for lack of a better term. When I got out there, I realized immediately that John Effort was not there. He was the federal Newfoundland minister who actually happened to be the natural resources minister at the time. I thought, this is a sham, this is going nowhere. It's a couple of days before Christmas, they you know, dragged us all the way out here, and they're gonna give us nothing. Everybody was talking about this meeting in, in the Winnipeg. expectations and, were... Oh, through the moon. And he felt the weight of that. Oh, had to. He, he felt yeah. the weight of, of those expectations from the people of the province. We had the hopes of 500,000 people riding on a plane with us to Winnipeg. 
They were trying to set us up. It was a jam. They were trying to give us less than what we were promised by the Prime Minister of the country. If they're not treating us as a true equal member in this federation, yeah. then we got a problem. It was then on the way back on the plane that I decided that we had to really do something dramatic to tell Ottawa and to tell Canada that we were being shafted here. And so I decided at that point, on the way back on the plane, contrary to the advice of everybody who was around me, was saying, don't do this. He said, uh, we're going to take down the flags. I'm going to take down the Canadian flag. The people of the country need to understand how serious, because it was a big deal. I'm not lowering the flags, I'm removing the flags. We have decades of disappointments by this government. They've turned their back on us. They have slighted us. These are our resources. This is a deal and a commitment that was made by the Prime Minister of Canada uh, to this province. It's, it's money, it's not, it's not a Christmas gift, it's something that we're entitled to. Newfoundland and Labrador has, you know, I think we comprise 10% of the, the armed forces in Canada. So there's an awful lot of sons and, and daughters and, and husbands yeah, and wives right. and, and uh, moms and dads in the military. And you wondered what their reaction was gonna be. So I, yeah. you know, I was quite concerned. Um, and uh, continue to be concerned during the news conference when you know, that flag's coming out, that flag, that flag. After this is over, that flag will be gone, that flag will be gone, and that flag will be gone. We had an agreement with the Government of Canada by the Prime Minister of the country. If he is not honouring his promise and his commitment, then he represents the Government of Canada. So when he sat in the Confederation building and he pointed and said, I'm taking that flag down and that one down and that one down and that one's coming down, he knew that's the clip. He knew that's the clip. He knew that's what they're going to see in BC. That's what they're going to see. That's what they're going to see in Quebec, in Toronto. That's what they're going to see in Manitoba, in Alberta. And do you know what the people of Canada said about that? Now there's my kind of guy. Right? And all of a sudden, he's the most popular premier in eight of the 10 provinces in Canada. How did that happen? Well, Paul Martin had to deal with that. Oh yeah, it was brilliant. Merry Christmas. We went on a, a tour basically to tell our story, left I think day after, by the Boxing Day or the day after and went to Toronto and, you know, went to the Globe and went to the Post and went to CBC and went to CTV and went to all the nationals and laid out exactly why we were disgruntled, why we were unhappy. The province was supporting him on this too. I mean, yeah. it was everywhere. People were talking about this and, you know, we're finally getting our dues, you know, yeah. good, good for you, Danny. And, mm -hmm. you know, going through the airports, you know, people would, would yeah. talk, you know, stick to your guns, we're owed this. Yeah. There's so much passion on it. You know, I remember you know, making calls to the Prime Minister's office and not getting them returned. In good times, you know, the Prime Minister referred to me as Danny and I would refer to him as Prime Minister, but he would say, call me Paul if we're in a, in a private meeting. He was very, quite a gentleman. But latter stages, when the phone rang and I asked for a conversation with him, I know that internally that he was, uh, not he, the office referred to me as the asshole from Newfoundland. So things had deteriorated significantly. I don't think anyone will ever know how hard he worked on that file. And not just, you know, the federal bureaucrats as well. I mean, everybody put a lot of time and effort, blood, sweat, and tears into that. But he was determined to make it happen. And there were many times we wondered whether or not it would. The Prime Minister was smoking mad too. I mean, oh, he was, was yeah. They, they had a little gathering afterwards, I think privately, to clear the air on some of the things that went on during the whole thing. Eventually, during that January period, we managed to get a dialogue going between the both sides, and a meeting was set up for Ottawa. I asked at that time to one of the, to the senior official who we were negotiating with if I could have just a moment with the Prime Minister. Not a chance, you know, he, he doesn't even want to go to this meeting. You know, it'd be better probably if you didn't because it might only harm the negotiation. I said, look, uh, you know, I just need a meeting with him. I just want to be able to sit down and put one question to him. So anyway, I was brought into this room with these huge 20, 30 foot doors. And eventually after what seemed an eternity, he walked into the room and he opened up the door and he said, Premier, and it was, like I said before, it was, we were on a first name basis. He said, Premier, and I said, Prime Minister, he said, do you have a question for me? And I said, yes, Prime Minister, I do. And he said, what is it? And I said, I know that you would like to tell me to go 
blank myself. I won't say the word, but I know you'd like to tell me to go blank myself. And he just kind of looked at me and a smile broke on his face and he said, you're exactly right. And I think ultimately, unlike perhaps other relationships with prime ministers, after the fact, that relationship was mended. And, uh, you know, they, they had a mutual respect for each other. We ended up coming home with a $2 billion check, which I think was not so much the significance of the amount of money, which for Newfoundland and Labrador was enormous. It was a huge amount of money. But more importantly, that, that rectangular piece of paper with the check, I, I guess, probably established a whole new sense of pride and self-esteem for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians because we had basically fought a battle and we had won. It's Valentine's Day. I'd go over and give him a big hug, only I'm afraid of the debate that has started around the country. <laughs> This is the most overwhelming feeling I've ever had in my young life. This is what it's all about. It's, it's what it's all about is not about money, it's not about money at all. It's about pride and respect and dignity and self-sufficiency and making Newfoundlanders and Labradorians number one, number one. You do in, indeed embody what this country is all about. The great ability of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to speak to speak to a vision that goes far beyond where they're from, to understand what in fact is the essence of nationhood. You, you embodied that in this negotiation, Premier Williams, and I want to say to you how proud you are. One of the things I was saying as a talk show host all the time was, isn't it a joy, a pleasure, that the debate we're having is about how to spend our money versus the debate that for decades we'd had about how do we get some money? I want to tell you something. A politician with cash is virtually undefeatable, and that's where Danny Williams found himself. All of a sudden, he was the first premier in the history of the province with money. Now, to be honest, Joey Smallwood in his day was considered to have the money because he had Ottawa's money. Danny had real money. Lovely. Who wants pepper? None for me, thanks, no. I never tried. I had to shut him up. I said, for God's sake, fellas, is that standing up? No. He tried in St. John's Centre for the nomination. You really didn't want him to run. Was that your father? Yeah. OK. Oh, he would be the worst in the world in politics, your father would have been. Why? He didn't have any diplomacy about No, he's too blunt. I think that's, yeah, yeah he, you know, he wouldn't, yeah. I know what you mean. That's exactly yeah. what you mean. We all come by that honestly sometimes. <laughs> sometimes you got to know when to pull it back, though. Yes, sometimes. but. I think it's a mistake to pull back too often. I agree with you. I agree. I agree. I never really asked him, you know, but uh, I think uh, I think he's shown it. To him, it didn't really matter what political party he, he it was. It, you know, if you were on the wrong side, no, you know, he, he didn't you care. Were again. Yeah. <laughs> he had an agenda for Newfoundland and Labrador, and it didn't matter to him what you were. But you were the you were the way to get to our solution. And, you know, he, he had a lot of these. I said it earlier, but he had a lot of these big battles along the way. And they all meant, you know, everything to the province. And some people got mowed down along the way. And that's oh, it. Yeah. If you're on the right, the wrong side, freight train Williams yeah. was coming through. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we're, uh, he's on a mission. He's got to get stuff yeah. done. And you know, when sorry it, if he bowled you over. I think during his time in office, we were the only ones who actually called him premier. Everyone else <laughs> called him Danny. Exactly. I mean, everybody. everybody.
everybody was. And yeah. that's the way he wanted it. Yeah. And even today, you know, people call him Mr. Williams and he can't stand it. People of this province have been very wise to have this man of vision, of integrity, of great leadership lead us for another four years. Please join with me. Thank you, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you very much. Tell us about this, this wonderful image here. Maybe you show the camera. Well, first of all, I don't, I don't wear hats very well, as you can see. I don't, that guy, I don't look very good in a baseball hat either, so a beret is not much better. Hugo Chavez was in his country basically uh, taking government control and ownership of all assets. That's not, of course, where I was at all. At that time, you know, it was relatively unheard of in North America that, you know, a, a local government, particularly a provincial government in Canada, would be trying to, you know, get a bigger share of the royalties and equity as well. So I was, I was, uh, Tag Danny Chavez, and I didn't mind. I didn't mind that. Actually, it's the, it actually draws attention to the issue and gives you an opportunity to explain it and explain why you're doing it and why you want to have a, a bigger share. So, so it worked out fine. But that was uh, at the height of the battle with the oil companies. Next up, Stephen Harper. <laughs> a message from the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, the Honourable Danny Williams. My fellow Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, good evening. Not long ago, I announced that we had become a have province. Many of you celebrated by buying stuff. Others, like me, showed restraint. For instance, this desk is merely gold-plated. Actually, we should do that again, and I'll pick one with a uh, slower spin time for you. Well, you know what I mean? Like, it goes like, if I pick one That's near the top. near closer, then it's not gonna. Nice, yeah. It works on free play or quarters. So if you oh, I see. I played Danny on the show before Danny was ever on. So I would do the impression of Danny. You know, you part the hair, you squint a little bit, and just no matter what it is, has to be. You get angry. You know, it could be anything. It could be about kittens. You know, look at these kittens out there. Newfoundland and Labrador were dogs. There's two types of dogs, Newfoundland dog, the Labrador dog. There's no Newfoundland cat for a reason. Cats cannot be trusted. Cats are a French animal. They sit on couches. <laughs> Politicians can either be villains or folk heroes. And the thing is, what the weird thing about Danny is, is that you have a multi-millionaire, big shot lawyer guy who's a folk hero. Uh, for, and he's the little guy, he's the underdog. And you just need a big enough Goliath, you know? We all continue to marvel at the poll numbers of Danny Williams. I think envy would be the right word. But heck, this guy, this guy gets higher approval ratings from the population than I do from my own family. Prime Minister Harper made a commitment uh, again on offshore resources, uh, I believe it was, and on changing the equalization, equalization. program to, uh, to allow that benefit to accrue to Newfoundland and Labrador. So we had a firm commitment in writing, and that's how it started. Mm. And I think Brian was um, a party to the beginning of the end. Yeah. <laughs> project that was in my lap at the time was the Hebron project and that was one that had been discovered some 25 to 30 years prior and nothing had happened so the whole issue was whether this fallow field would be and should be and could be developed by the oil companies. Our infrastructure requirements in this province were absolutely enormous and we needed many many billions of dollars in order to do that. Well, that's why the Accord was so important, that's why there were more revenues from the oil companies were important, and that's why this commitment that Harper had made to us would have been that last chunk of cash that we needed in order to take care of this. Prime Minister Harper came to Ganner for a convention, and of course things were very friendly. You know, the, the Premier generally tried to make that work. You know? I don't he think put the he... olive branch out, but it didn't last long. 
me and my chief of staff and he and his chief of staff uh, went to a meeting in Hotel Garda in one of the rooms there, and he uh, said, well, okay, where do you want to start? And I said, well, I'd like to start uh, with uh, fellow fields, because I said, that's something that's current. I need to get you to step up now and, and basically say that Canada is not going to stand for the oil companies, you know, standing back. And of course, I have, you know, your, your commitment on uh, offshore resource revenue. And the Prime Minister said, uh, I haven't made my mind up on that yet, Danny. And it, uh, it, it got very uncomfortable <laughs> from then on. Yeah. And he turned to me and he said, well, you're not going to F up my country. And I said, oh, is that right? So I moved over closer to him. And Danny said, if you fuck with my province, I'll chase you to the ends of the fucking earth or something. Four corners of the earth. Four, Four corners, corners to be precise, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I will chase you to the four corners of the earth or the three coasts in this country uh, to take you down if you're not supportive of my province and the issues that are important to us. That's where we got off to a bad start. And uh, I remember looking over at the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff and he was like me with his head just kind of buried <laughs> writing notes, you know. We were walking down the hall to uh, Elizabeth and Steve and he said, uh, uh, I don't think uh, I'm going to need speaking notes for my speech tonight. <laughs> Never a good sign. And you get that feeling in your stomach. <laughs> He's off script. He's off script. <laughs> He's going rogue. The first time I met him and his, his initial comments about Atlantic Canadians are a culture of defeat, I think that represented very much what his thoughts are about Atlantic Canada and Newfoundland and Labrador. In fact, in meetings with him, he said we don't need Newfoundland to get elected. That said it all for me. The fact that he started a confrontation with me in a, in a friendly setting, you know, at the first private meeting we had, that, that was a red rag to the bull for me because that's the way the ground rules are going to be, buddy. I'll play by those rules if you want to, right? So. How's your meeting? How's your meeting? If Stephen Harper gets a majority government, I remind you of the words of Bachman Turner Overdrive. You ain't seen nothing yet. Danny stands up when Harper is on the flight going back to Ottawa and announces at the annual convention that this guy and his party are now persona non grata. And if he has his way, not one conservative will be elected federally. When that blue symbol comes up and that conservative symbol, and we're progressive conservatives in this province, when that comes up, there better be a big goose egg for the Conservatives if they haven't delivered on their province right here. Who can trust the Prime Minister anyway? Is it okay for the man occupying the highest office in our country to treat a province in the Federation with such disdain? A majority government for Stephen Harper would be one of the most negative political events in Canadian history. Vote anything but Conservative. It's as easy as A, B, C. But while the ABC campaign worked here, it did nothing nationally. Stephen Harper has a stronger minority than when the election began. Reminds me something very interesting that Don Jameson said, another Newfoundland political icon. That he said dealing with Trudeau, he always worried as a politician that Trudeau would take a principle to the point where he forgot the primary objective. And the primary objective is to govern, do what's best for the people. I wonder if people won't look back on the Stephen Harper, Danny Williams relationship and say, the breakdown of that relationship was bad for the people. Do you have regrets about that at all? Like your, the antagonism between you guys? Not at all. It's absolutely necessary, and you know, if I, if I hadn't been ready to move on, I would have liked to have been around to see it through, you know, yeah. to be quite honest with you, but uh, I had a 10-year window, and his window didn't coincide directly with mine. So anyway, that left a very bad taste in my mouth, so then I said, fine, we're just going to dig in directly with the oil companies. So we went to the oil companies and said, oil's going to stay in the ground. If you're not interested in our terms, then that's it. Uh, they pulled back. They pulled back from negotiation. They indicated that the negotiation was over. Some of the, uh, the business communities out there were, were wanting the, the deal, but the, uh, the grassroots folks, they uh, yeah. stayed by it, you know, hold off and, and get the right deal. 
He knew they were coming back. He said it repeatedly, they will be yeah. back. They got nowhere else to go. This is a good environment to develop oil offshore. He said they'll be, they'll be back here. There were times, early days, where you know, we would look at each other or I would say to myself, you can't do that, that's not gonna work. And, but it always worked. We drove them to the wall and then they finally came back and said, okay, we're prepared to talk. We went into a long, protracted negotiation. The ultimate outcome was that we got equity, that we got a good royalty, that we had a super royalty, which in fact will mean many tens of billions of dollars uh, to the provincial treasury over time. Politics is a sport here. You comment on it, you have favorite players, big personalities do well, like a John Crosby or a Danny Williams, and people will kind of turn on someone who's boring pretty quick, right? Because you don't just want someone to pave roads and hand out baby bonus checks. You also want someone who is gonna explode every now and then or say something wrong or give you something to talk about. Otherwise, what's the sense of having him there, you know? That's like when he called into the radio that day. It's like, you know, freaking out. Uh, <laughs> poor old Randy. And one of the things I noticed that morning is that the number one story in our newscast was about the Hebron oil development. Another big win for Danny. The fourth story down in the newscast was about the Newfoundland fishery. In the preamble, not thinking too much about it, made a comment along the lines of, to the audience, something like, you know, isn't it interesting? That was a time in our history when what was the fourth story in our newscast this morning would have been number one. That was one of my thin-skinned moments where I was just driving along the car by myself because, you know, I never had a chauffeur or had anybody drive me. And I thought, I, got, I, I just got to call in. I got to call in. So I hopped in by the side of the road. Producer in your ear is saying, Randy, Premier is on line two. Because I've had several calls of people who heard your opening comments. <laughs> and said, why is he being negative this morning? But I, I wasn't, I being, I wasn't being negative. I can't understand for the life of me why, when we've now negotiated another deal here. He was, what we would say in, in local terms, he was savage, but. A lot of wonderful things happening in Newfoundland and Labrador. We don't need that kind of pessimism and crap coming out of your mouth in the mornings, I can tell you right now. Do you think that was pessimism? Uh, pessimism. To pose that? Why? Why? To pose that question. You're the reason that I keep going in this job because it's the skeptics and the negative people in this province that have kept us, us, those lobsters clawed back in the pot year after year after year. But I refuse to listen to pessimists like you. We're going to move forward and we're going to do it despite you. Now you have a nice day. Thank you very much. What was that all about? Goodbye. Wow. Wow. All right. Goodbye. I was actually left for the first time in 40 some odd years with not a word to say. I didn't know what to do. That particular morning was, and I, and I know I know my staff were, had to be in the office, listened to open line going, what is he doing? Why did he hire him? I said, well, you like, this is, this is a good announcement. Why don't we just let that go? But I'm the type of guy sometimes who can't let, who can't let things pass. And, and, and Randy's a good match for me too. Sometimes she would just say, you're, you know, you, you know you're doing the right thing, and you have 95% of the people in the province support you. What about the other 5%? I need them to understand. So he's, he would have been a good actor, you know? As long as he only played angry people, he would be a great actor. Like a 70s cop show, you know? I heard, take my badge, take my badge. You know, that kind of guy, he'd be great. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't remember him being overly stubborn. I don't think so. <laughs> oh, I got to stick up from somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he did force his hand a lot. He pushed his way through. You know, he took, I guess, uh, sort of a more business approach than, than political and uh, kind of is a bit his way or the highway. He stood on his two feet and he, and he didn't back down. He was intimidating. That's what I liked about him. It seemed like uh, former premiers seemed to bend over backwards to please the Canadian government, you know, but he sort of said, no, you know, if, if, if we're not going to get what we're going to get, like, for example, the oil, he said, we'll keep the oil, you know, in the ground if we have to, we're not going to give it away. The Premier felt that, um, you know, ultimately we had campaigned and fought for, you know, our term of office to be treated fairly within the Canadian Federation. and he. He felt the same um, should be, you know, the way we, as a provincial government, were treating the Aboriginal peoples of the province, so. Aboriginal people, and I've seen them coast to coast and the coast in this country, they, they all feel they've been wronged. 
there are a lot of very serious issues where there's been neglect by federal and provincial government. Like us, at a, whole, at a similar level, they just want fair treatment from the people who are governing them. And if I'm going to seek it from Ottawa, then I need to give it to the Aboriginal people in our province as well. signed will be the Labrador Inuit Comprehensive Land Claims Agreement. In 1956 and 1959, the government of Newfoundland at that time closed the communities of Nutak and Hebron. Today, the government of Newfoundland and Labrador, on behalf of the citizens of the province, apologizes to the Inuit of Nutak and Hebron. We accept your apology for ourselves our ancestors and our descendants. We have waited over 45 painful years for this apology, and we accept it because we want the pain and the hurting to stop. Good. Good to go. Okay, so we're kind of tight on time, actually. It became apparent to us all that people think he's larger than life. Hello, how are you? Dad will come drop by and say, you know, come on, Abby, Gabe, Charlie, let's go to a movie. They even can't go to a movie with him now. People just come up and, you know, they want an autograph or they want to just sit there and chat and chat. It's too hard to be in the public with them, you know, unless he's in one of his nice cars and Gabriel has no problem going with him then. <laughs> that part of it, uh, that part of it's hard. You, kind of, you lose your dad to politics. Politics just picks away, picks away. Has politics changed him? And had it, has it affected his personal relationships and his family? Yes, it has. And, and I don't think I need to sit here and, and explain what's happened. That's, you know, it, it's, it's public, public knowledge that he's, he's uh, separated and divorced. And uh, would that have happened had the politics not come along? Who knows? This actually, actually shows four, four of my grandchildren. We now have two more grandchildren, and because they're infants and babies, they were both born, two boys, both born in the last six months. You know, the family is, is growing in leaps and bounds, and I gotta tell you, that's, uh, that's a really important part of my life. Well, he sets his mind on something, and he envisions something. It's like he just sees it in his mind, and he just goes ahead and does it, and fulfills it, and makes sure it's done, and he doesn't stop until it's finished. And I think that's the same thing with politics, you know, why he got in and why he got out. I finally got the Lower Churchill put together as a deal. I thought, OK, it's time to go. And I decided, you know, my, my bucket list was done from my perspective. And, you know, you can wear out your welcome. I'm also a believer that if you stay around too long, you'll start to believe your own bullshit. And people around you will start to cover you with your own bullshit. And then, you, you know, so it's done. That's why I decided to go on. Daddy Williams shocked Newfoundland and Labrador and the rest of the country with the announcement that he was resigning as premier. Did you get the oil? Yes, Carl Pollock. Did you get Lower Churchill? Yes, Carl Pollock. Did you throw a tantrum like a huge baby every time you didn't get your way? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he did that. Yeah. Going from a have-not province to a have province is huge. If nothing else happened, if there was no other legacy, just that. What that does for Newfoundlanders, what that does for some kid 
who's going to go on a school trip to Ontario. Just that, watching that change, and all of a sudden people are puffed up their chest, you know, and like, oh yes, yeah, so that crowd over there and our oil money and all this stuff, you know, and it's great. That kind of fixes things for a lot of people, generationally, mentally. I don't think I was prepared at all for the emotion of that day, if you watch some of the footage. And, uh, you know, I, I remember even after my, my hairdresser said to me, she said, you know, everyone in the salon stopped and they just watched the TV. Right up until that morning, nobody knew. I mean, it was a shock. And then I remember his mom was coming in. <laughs> and we got the call from security. CBC has Mrs. Williams. And it was just mayhem on the floor. Get down to the lobby. To my family, and in particular my mother, who has always been, I can't look at her because I'm going to lose her, <laughs> has always been such an inspiration to me. She has been the ultimate advisor, the political matriarch, my role model, and more than anything, she's just the best mom. We have come this far together, and the best is yet to come. I will miss you, and I love you all. God guard thee, Newfoundland, Labrador. when he announced that he was leaving. And I mean, it was like a friggin' funeral, you know? People were devastated. If Danny Williams leaves, who's gonna take care of us? It was literally kind of like that. People were buried with pictures of Joyce Small, and I'm sure it's gonna be somebody, probably have a picture of Danny in her casket, you know? And, uh, and but also people will crack open Joey's coffin and stick a stake through it to make sure he's still dead, and there'll be people sharpening stakes around Danny's casket too. Uh, but that's when you know you made uh, a difference. He was straight up. He ran Newfoundland as if it was his own business. I would say he was the leader that this province needed at the time. It's nice being able to tell somebody you're from Newfoundland and have pride in it. He made us feel proud of ourselves, right? Along with him being who he is, which he should be proud of himself, period. But he even made me feel proud of myself because he was a premier. She said, we'll never have anybody again like him. I told yes, you will, that's it. After a while, that's it, he'd be getting on your nerves. And that's what happens, they get fed up with them all. When you're out in the public eye, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you're, if you're fortunate enough to be privileged, then you have to take the shit. You've got to be prepared to be a target, too. I, uh, I just think from my own personal perspective and even from a leadership perspective, whether it happens to be a business leader or a lawyer making a decision or a politician as a leader making a decision, you need to be decisive and stand by it. You don't know you're right. You think you're right, and you hope you're right, and if you've done all your homework, your chances are you're gonna be right. 
I mean, my political perspective, you know, I could be 50 years before, I won't be around, but I could be 20 years before I find out whether, you know, I was right or not. But some things have to stand the test of time. <laughs>